I know, I know this question's been asked a few times, but who, who, who is a Scala developer here? Full, full time, okay. And who, who, who hasn't used Scala Check or who doesn't know what Scala Check is? Well, that's good. There's usually about half, half the audience puts their hand up at that point. So um, uh, people, people who know about Scala Check, do you use it? Are you, are you afraid of it? You know, do you, do you get a bit intimidated by it? Brilliant, <laughs> excellent. Well, it sounds like it sounds like I'm going to be uh, preaching to a lot of converted people already. But um, hopefully, hopefully, we'll learn some new things because one of the things I want to talk about today is is not just what Scala Check is, but also how we can go about making the best use of the tool. So um, I'm going to I'm going to assume very little knowledge. If I'm going too slow, let me know, and we'll just speed up and get to the more interesting stuff. Okay, so for those who don't know, or the one person who doesn't know what it is, um, brief example. So Scala Check, it, it's a testing library for Scala. Um, it's, it's similar, but actually a little bit different to, to unit testing libraries in, in the way that you, you write and you think about tests. So the, the heart of the, uh, of the library is this method here called for all. Okay, and what we can do with this is we can pass in a type parameter and then we can have some code, and this code usually ends up with a predicate, or what we call a prop or a property. And then what's going to happen is we want to test that this property holds for all of the type that came in. So if for some reason we wanted to write our own tests for strings, um, and the, the length uh, method in particular, this is, this is a property that needs to hold. I mean, this is quite clearly not the most comprehensive test ever written, um, but this is something that should always be true. No matter what string we look at, if the length is ever negative, like, it just doesn't make sense, like something's gone wrong. Okay, so we, we can call check on this prop. Scala check then run, runs our property with at least 100 um, different strings. And then hopefully these will all pass um, and we're all good to go. Okay? And also this just works straight out of the box with SBT. So while, I've, while I'm on the REPL here and I've called .check, actually if we just put these properties in a file and call SBT test, um, the test works as well. And if, if some of the properties don't hold, then the build halts. Okay? So what Scala Check is, okay, I like to think of it as a bridge between types and values. Really, what we want to use Scala Check for is we want to make sure things are invariant that for some reason we can't really encapsulate in the type system. So kind of a, a nice example, I think, of this is like if you imagine, say, the Boolean type, like you, you wouldn't write tests that made sure it either returned true or false. Like the Boolean type is constrained to only return two values. And what might happen is, say, say like if we go back to that length uh, property we saw a minute ago, is that actually the type that length returns is not actually right. Like it's returning an integer, but actually what we want is some kind of non-negative number. Uh, out of the box, Java and Scala don't give us that. So we want to make sure that the, the values that the type produces are actually constrained to be within a certain set of values. Now, of course, if we just used, a, if we had a length function with an unsigned integer type, which do exist, then we wouldn't need a property that said, make sure it's always greater than or equal to zero because it physically can't be anything else. So other things, um, if, you, if you have a, a, a secret class or a dumping ground in your application for all your stub data or your your test examples of you know your your reports or your properties with all the fields filled out like you should be using Scala check instead that's what this is for we'll take a look at some now and they, these are these are generally useful enough to, to get started with okay so a few of them as long as long as we make this import then all of these are then available to us so we can create strings that only contain letters out of the box, the, the generator of strings produces kanji and emoji and numbers and basically anything that's printable, okay? Um, positive numbers, and notice here that actually this, um, this is parameterized. So as long as there's a, a type class of numeric for this type, then we can produce positive numbers. So 
this work with integers and floats and doubles and things like that. But also, if someone else writes a nice number library, like something perhaps Inspire, then as long as we have a numeric for that, we can create positive numbers. Okay? One of. So we can say, actually, there's a list here and we want a generator to pick something arbitrarily from this list. And this is useful, say, perhaps might be worth in an integration test. So you could do some setup before the test to maybe go to a database, pull a load of records out, and then your one of will then take one of those queried records. And then maybe you're working with real data and that might be a bit more valuable to you. We have list of, so we can give a list of generators, and then from that list it will produce a generator of lists, and there's list of n, so we can say produce lists, but they need to be of a certain length. And there's one other that's in a different class, and that is arbitrary. And we'll look at this a bit later on, and why, why this is useful. Okay? So, if we've got some generators, we, we can pop onto the REPL and have a quick look at how they work. They come with a sample method, and these produce options of the values. So for if some reason the generator cannot produce a value, it will produce none. So you know if the, the random pool is exhausted or, or something similar. Like I said, gen is a monad, so we can really use this with four comprehensions. So we can create a brand new generator from ones that already exist. Um, so we can pick a, um, an uppercase letter, and then we can have a list of lowercase letters and then we can create a generator that puts those together and some kind of generator for names, perhaps, where we'd always expect the first name to be capitalized. And because this is a generator, we can just call sample and we'll get something like that. Okay? And the arbitrary type class. So what this does is, all this does is this allows us to summon a generator arbitrarily. Okay? And here, here's, a, here's a brief example. So we have our own type here some kind of case class, and what we're going to do is we're going to use this alpha generator, and then we're going to map our, our, our generated value into the apply function that comes with the case class, and this gives us a generator of records. And then if we, if we mark this uh, arbitrary as implicit, and all we have to do is pass the generator in the t into the constructor, we can then do things like this. So this for all now, with no parameters, can produce records. So that's really quite nice, is that we've got all this plumbing and machinery already, and just by having an implicit for our type, this will work. Okay. So now we can use this, this generator we saw on a couple of slides ago, is the arbitrary with the type. And as long as there is an implicit arbitrary, it will summon that generator and allow us to then um, produce arbitrary values. This, this, this can be useful, say, inside four comprehensions if we want to build up other, other ones and we don't really, we just want to summon the, the, the generator that exists for that type. So a question here is that, maybe you've seen, is that we can have lots of different generators for a single type. You know, I've shown that we could have alpha strings or alphanumeric strings, and then we created our own one, some kind of name generator for strings. But which gen instance do we actually want to tag with this arbitrary type? And I'd say, as a rule, is that whichever generator produces a full range of values. You know, if we had um, an arbitrary generator for strings that only produced uppercase letters, then if we use our for all with, with no parameters, it will always summon that type, and we would never test it with lowercase characters, for instance. So we might be missing some, some, some potential bugs or holes in our, in our application design. Okay, that's a pretty whirlwind, whirlwind tour of, of the, those kind of two main classes. A lot of people often say, what's the difference between arbit arbitrary and gen? Why would I use one over the other? Is that really, gen is the real workhorse, and we use arbitrary just to tag a particular generator to make that available implicitly. Okay? So, a lot of times, people, people seem to have a, a bit of a struggle working out how to get the best value out of, um, out of Scala check. Um, it, it's not a drop-in replacement for something like JUnit or specs or something like that. You do have to think about things slightly differently in order to really kind of get to grips with how this works. And 
this is kind of what, where I want to spend the most of the time now is really looking at how we design properties. And so I want to talk about this game. Um, I've given this talk a few times and not many people seem to have heard of this game, although it's kind of popular with children in the UK. Um, and so we have five dice and we're going to roll them and we can produce these different what I call hands or scores. So it's quite, quite similar to poker in a way in that you know, if we have Yahtzee, that's five of a kind, all five dice are the same, that's the best we can do. A straight, so we have one, two, three, four, five, or maybe two, three, four, five, six. Um, all the way down, full house, three of one and two of another. Um, and the, and the ordering here, it basically, the higher up, the, the, the better a hand is. So what, what we want to do is we want to have this function here. We want to implement that, is that we want to say, given two hands, which one won? We want to write this winner function. Um, we're not actually going to write this winner function. We're going to look at how we would test it. OK, so if you're not a Scala Check user or you're not that familiar, you could probably start to think about how you just use, like, write tests for this anyway. Like, this is nothing unusual, I'd hope. You know, you could probably think of how, how you would uh, go about writing some tests for an implementation like this. So let's have a look at how we could do this with Scala Check. OK, so here's, here's our plan of attack. We're going to generate two random hands. We're going to work out which one is better. And then we're going to check that it wins. I, that seems pretty fair. And, and here's, here's, a, a, here's a, a, a snippet of the code. So we've used our for all. We can assume we've got some generators and some arbitraries. So we can arbitrarily summon hands. OK, and then well, we're going we're gonna to go through the first one. And if these are all the same, then we've got Yahtzee. And then we do, if they're all in a sequence, we've got a straight. And if there's three of a kind and two of another, a full house, and so on. And then we want to do the exact same thing for the other hand. We then want to work out which one is better. And then we want to call our winner function and make sure that it, it actually won. OK? Does that, does that make sense? What do, what do you think? Exactly, yeah. So this is where a lot of people get s stuck with Scala Check, is that they actually just re-implement their application code inside the test. And that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, like, this will work, I'm sure. You know, it would be fine. Won't be the most comprehensive or the best solution. So, Indeed, yeah, yeah. Um, so okay, right. So let's let's stop and and think about how we can do this. Here, here's another here's another idea. Rather than producing hands, we'll produce random dice. We'll construct known hands with those dice, and then we can confirm that when we call our winner function, the right one wins. And here's here's an example. So we're going to generate three dice. And with one of the dice, we're going to create a Yahtzee hand. With the other two dice, we're going to create a full house hand, which was three of a kind and two of a kind. Notice here that the dice to make the full hand need to be different, because if they were all the same, that's a Yahtzee, and not a full house. And then we call the winning hand, and we call it both ways round, just to make sure that that's consistent. And that works, right? What do people, what do people think to that? Okay, yep, that's, that's fair. Um, there's something a bit more fundamental in that we're only testing one combination here. Like, we're only testing that Yahtzee beats Full House. You know, we'd have to make sure that Full House beats three of a kind and four of a kind beats three of a kind and things like that. Okay, and there are other untested conditions. Dif different permutations of the position, like you said. So, you know, is if we look at the full house, you've got three A's and two B's. Would that pre be the same as two B's and three A's or one B, three A's and the other B's and things like that? You know, so those permutations are not, are not considered here. And also, Comparing all the winning hands is going to be quadratic, which actually, for something as small as this, is 
it's not too much effort to write, but you know, if we were dealing with, with a bigger domain, it would get out of hand very, very quickly. Okay, so let's think again. Can we do better? Okay, here's, here's a third idea, right? We'll generate pairs of known hands, not just hands, but known hands. We'll make sure that the one that should win actually wins, okay? So this is a bit more involved. So the first thing we need to do is create a generator for each hand, okay? And here's, here's what it might look like. So this is how we would generate a Yahtzee hand. So we've got a, a, a list of dice. We want to pick one of the dice, and then we just map that onto a hand case class with the dice in all the positions, okay? And then here's an example of, say, three of a kind. And so, similarly, we want to pick a dice. We then want to pick another one that wasn't the one we've already picked. And then we want to pick a third one, which wasn't one of the two we've already picked. And then we can create a hand from that. But again, notice here, I've not put the different positions of the dice purely, purely for the slide. I've got this code on GitHub, which actually does do that. So if you don't believe me, you can, you can look there. Okay. So we, we could have generators for all of the hands here. So Yahtzee, straight, full house, three of a kind, all those. Okay. And so our next step then is we want to order these generators to reflect which generator is better than another one. Okay. So can anyone think of a good type that works for ordering? Yeah, or just a list, yeah, simple as that. So actually this, this here is what we're actually gonna test. This is our property here, is that we want to make sure that Yahtzee beats straight, beats full house, beats four of a kind, beats three of a kind. But these are generators, okay? So our next step now, we want to use Scala check to partition this list, and because it's ordered, the, the generators in the first partition should beat all the, ha all the generators in the second partition. But we'll leave it up to Scala check as to where to draw the line. And then what we can do then is from our two lists, we can take a generator from each list and make sure that that beats the other one. Okay? And this, this, this property would start to look something like this. So we pick a number between one and the number of, of generators we've got. We split our generators here. And then, one thing I do have to say is the code I'm writing now is not actually legitimate Scala chat code due to the way the API works. However, conceptually, this is all fine. Again, the implementation on GitHub does it properly, but it, basically the, the, there's a, a constraint that when you have a list of generators, you have to have at least two. So the, the, the function has um, three parameters of a generator, a generator, and then a list of remaining generators. But for brevity, I, d I didn't want to put that on this slide. And then what we want to do, and th th this is then the, the rest of that property. And notice here that we've actually got a nested property. So we've taken the, the first value from this property, and then we're using that to generate a new property. So we've, we've got our, our two pairs of generators, we want to pick one from the winners, pick one from the losers, and then make sure that that works, okay? And then we, we run this in Scala check, and we're all good, ship it. What do people think to that? Better? Yeah. I think, I, think that's, I think that's a lot better. So there is a bonus step as well, is that, you know, it's all well and good, you know, looking at the test and going, oh, it's great, 100 passes, we're all good to go. But, you know, you might think being a, you know, a developer, you might put a cheeky print line in just to see what's getting, getting actually tested, you know, just before you commit it and things. But we can actually do that legitimately as part of the framework. And that's using this collect function. So here's the code again, it's exactly the same as before, but I've just wrapped our property in this collect function. And this takes a parameter of any type, I've just used a string here, and I want to say that this is playing against that, the winner is playing against the loser. 
okay? And then when we run this, we then get output that looks something like this. So you can see here, hopefully you, you might be a bit more familiar with, with the way this is now, is that all these hands on the left are better than all these hands on the right. And also you can see that some, some of these came out a lot more frequently than others. And that's due to the way ScalaCheck skews the data and I was talking about earlier to kind of look at the corner cases, which might not always be legitimate for maybe something like lists where you want to treat everything fairly. And you can change the weighting inside ScalaCheck to, to do that. Another thing to notice here, when I ran this, is that there's actually one pairing missing here of a full house against four of a kind, which should come about there. Um, and that's just because it didn't run on, the, on this implementation. I ran it again and it appeared. And this is just the nature of random testing, is that you're not always going to get everything covered. There are ways you can mitigate this, such as running more tests or being explicit about what you want tested. But I, I, I would still be confident that this would be fully tested because if I implemented this and it was part of a CI check-in, it's getting tested every time I, I, I commit some code. Okay, just remember this is inherently random. Okay, so just to kind of finish off, I uh, want to look at a few kind of tips and techniques for, for how to get the best value over what we've seen today. So I showed this imp implication function earlier and I also showed another way to deal with it and that was with generators. And if you have the option, always try to use generators over implication. Okay, so any ideas what this, what this property will do? So we're looking for three integers. We then want to make sure that all our integers are positive and then we just call this passed function which says that the test passes. What do we think this is gonna do? Yep, yep, and it actually fails. ScalaCheck dies because it can't produce enough data. It basically, it's discarded so much that it's saying, your constraints are too strong, I'm giving up because I'll be here forever. Which actually, that blows my mind really that something as relatively as simple as that can cause ScalaCheck to fall over. So if you have the option, you just use a positive number generator and then we're going to discard nothing and then we get a pass straight away, okay? Another thing that a lot of people don't know about is that you can actually label the generators themselves. So here's, here's an example. Say, say we want to generate some arbitrary map and then a number that we want to look up a value in this map. And hopefully now that you get a bit of a flavor for how ScalaCheck works, that you'd expect this test not to pass, right? Because it eventually ScalaCheck is going to use an empty map and then whatever number is given is not going to be in that map, okay? And that will look something like this. So it's trying to pull one out of an empty map and clearly that is not defined, okay? So what we can do instead is we can, we can label these generators just to make it a little bit clearer as to what they do. So this map is maybe some kind of lookup database and then we want to look at a particular index in there. And obviously, again, this still fails, but notice here that this is just a little bit more friendly, which, you know, if something starts failing six months after you've written it and you've got half a dozen maps and a couple of strings and all that kind of stuff, it's not always clear as to what these types are for. But really, you can just label them and, and make, them, make the most of them there. And as well as labeling generators, you can label properties as well, which is actually a much better idea than just putting in a cheeky print line throughout, throughout your tests. So for instance, say we wanted to test this property, uh, which I think is a fair one to hold, is that if we've got two numbers, the square of the bigger number should be bigger than the square of the smaller number. That's a property that should hold. And for some reason that doesn't work, but well, we've got, we've got to work out some stuff here, right? Is that these are the numbers that were passed in, but it would be nice if we knew what numbers we were actually working with when, when, we, when we did our, our, our property check. And we can, we can apply a string here with this 
this function, similar to the generator, but we're applying it on the property. And it's just a string, so we can put whatever we want in here. So I've put in the values that we, we were given, and then also the values that we calculated. And then when it fails, we have a lot more information to go on, and that's just going to make debugging a lot easier. Um, I assume this has failed because we've probably multiplied numbers that are end up bigger than the range of integers or things like that. So we can start to use these kind of fun combinators that are really quite generic to, to, you, to do some really interesting things. So say we want to have some kind of database that we want to, to query, and we want to query it with data that we know will succeed and data that we know will fail. So it's a bit similar to that map we just saw a minute ago. So we could write a function like this. I won't go into too much detail apart from to look at the types, is that this returns a generator of a triple. It will give us a map of A to B, a list of A's and a list of A's. And the way we can think about this is this, this first parameter is going to be our lookup database. This second list is going to be values that exist in our database. So we should always call those and expect them to be present in the map and we can then work with whatever the map returns. And then this other list then is going to be things that are not in the map. So we could always call a map with that and expect nothing back. Okay, the implementation is pretty straightforward and not, not that interesting. And so we could use this, you know, this is just kind of proving that this works. So for all the successful in the list, make sure it's defined and for all the failures in the list, make sure it's empty and that just works. So hopefully you could see, you know, rather than dealing with some mocking framework or something like that, we could really just create something and we know we've got enough context here to know what's going to work and what's not going to work inside our, inside our map. And then as I mentioned earlier, just a, a quick one here, is that there's a flag inside SBT that lets us run Scala check asking for more tests. So if we do this originally, then we get 100 tests, but then we can pass in a flag here, which how many tests we want to run. And then now this runs with a million, and obviously this time took zero seconds, and now it takes 17, which, you know, if you were, if you were dealing with uh, CI server, this is something you might want to do there, rather than just on, on a development environment or something like that. We've got two more topics to talk about. Last one, cogen. Um, so before Scala check 113, if we wanted to produce arbitrary functions, it often looks something like this. So we can summon the arbitrary for integers to strings, and then if we call it with an integer, we get some string back. And if we call it with another integer, in this example, we've got another string back. Okay, maybe we, maybe we were unlucky. So let's, let's do it again, and we'll generate another random function. And the values are the same. And actually, if you look at the implementation, the arbitraries for functions actually ignore the input type and only return the same value. So it's kind of fake in a way, and it's not, not particularly useful. Um, however, that changed in Scala check 113. Yeah, so for, for our function, um, we didn't really care about the A, and as long as we had a, a generator for Bs, we could generate these functions. But now, we get different stuff happening. And so we generate this arbitrary function, and then when we call it with different values, we might get different responses. Of course, due to, what we, due to the types or the, the, the actual function we got mapped, we might actually end up with the same value in, in some instances. Um, and I won't go into the details, but basically, if we want an arbitrary function from A to B, we need to have this cogen type for A and the generator type for B. For all of your kind of core Scala library functions, cogens are generally there. Um, in a nutshell, what it does is it, um, there's a function on the cogen trait that um, basically permutes the, the random number generator with the input you gave it. So it's referentially transparent. So if you call F4 again, you'd get that same value. Okay. And then finally, this one thing to talk about is boilerplate reduction. And uh, a lot of the stuff we've actually seen today, we can completely remove from our code, uh, which is really quite useful using this library called Scala Check Shapeless. 
and um, there's a functionality inside Shapeless which um, lets you automatically derive type classes. Uh, and as long as we, we include the library, we kind of get this for free. And here's a full example. And look, I, I've, I've, launched, I've launched a console here, so there's no lying in what I've done. So I create a case class with some types. I then do this single import, org.scalacheck.shapeless.underscore. And then we'll also import this arbitrary here. And then we can now summon arbitraries for the type we've just created. We've not created any generators. We've not created any arbitraries. Yet this works, which is amazing. It's like black magic. And um, there's a few rules. There's a few rules to what we can do with this. Is that we can derive any arbitrary as long as the following rules hold. Is that the type we want is a case class or a sealed trait family of case classes, also known as an algebraic data type. We can summon an implicit arbitrary for all of the constituent types of the case class or the sealed trait hierarchy, either through automatic derivation or otherwise. So in our example we saw here, we can derive arbitraries for integers and strings because Scala check provides them. Okay, compile times dramatically increase a lot. However, Miles has a fix that's going into Scala 212 something, um, which actually removes all of the, the increase in, in compile time. So that makes this library a lot, lot more useful and friendly. And finally, one more thing I'd like to talk about, it's a bit, a bit of a plug, is um, a library we've been working on with 47 degrees is that to create sensible date and time objects for use in Scala check, because if we leave Scala check to its own devices, we're, if we try and produce dates and times, maybe just off the number of milliseconds, um, we might get times that are in prehistoric ages or far into the future, that they're really outside of any logical use for a domain. And so, we want to maybe constrain within, within, the, uh, within, within a certain range. So we have this generator here, and we can say from a certain time, perhaps now, for a duration of seven days, so anywhere between now and seven days from now, we want to generate some times. And then you can see here that this small sample I've done now in this case was the 1st of uh, September, and all of these times are Seven, within seven days of that, which uh, is quite, quite useful, I hope. Um, there's other things this library can do as well, is that you can constrain the granularity of um, the generated dates and times. So if your domain does not care about anything smaller than a minute, you can tell this library to only create minutes, hours, days, years, and so on. And so the inspiration for this library came from a previous job. We were dealing with TV schedules where we, we didn't care about anything less than a second. So we didn't want it generating lots of similar times where the milliseconds are different because our domain just didn't, didn't use them. So there's some more information about it here. Um, and I'm planning, I'm planning to, to um, update this library very soon and maybe incorporate a few other things from this talk as well. Um, if people had any input to that, you know, please come and talk to me or feel free to raise an issue and I would uh, definitely look to incorporate that in a version one. Um, that's all I had time for. Uh, I hope it wasn't too fast. I, uh, I hope it was useful. And if, if there's one question, it better be good. Yeah, you don't hope it's useful. You should say you should write and you have to write properly based tests. Yeah, yeah. No more questions. Hi. It's only a very short statement. You shouldn't write proper device tests for tests that use actual database. I, I wholeheartedly disagree with that statement. I wholeheartedly disagree with that statement. Well, I mean, it's, it's just a data source, right? So you've got to be careful. But I've, um, I've, I've used Scala Check on a full-blown chat application. So that was taking a copy of data from production, pulling um, certain numbers of users into a, a small set, and then generating conversations between them 
which would all get persisted to a database and then we could then query that and make sure that the conversation is as such. It's not straightforward, you know, when it comes to things like shrinking, is that as soon as a test fails, you're going to run your test a lot more to work out where the border is. And so if you're not careful, you, like for instance, you don't want to be dropping and rebuilding a, a database on every single test because that is going to be huge, even for just 100 tests. But say it failed on the 99th test, and then it takes another 200 iterations to work out the border. You know, that, that's not feasible. But as long as you're sensible, that you definitely, definitely can use ScalaCheck for integration testing, whether that's a database or a web service. It's just like all computer science and all development, you've just got to be aware of what you're doing and be very sensible about it. But it's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks.